and I have uh, my hero and friend and GM of my own co-op here as a special guest, Clem Nyland. Clem, you want to say hello to folks and uh, let them know you're here too? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody from uh, very sunny and warm Burlington, Vermont. Nice. It is a great day here. Um, so this, uh, this workshop today is the first in a series. Um, we're going to do some uh, basically trying to help GMs put together uh, template ideas for template monitoring reports based on the uh, C-Build um, template policies, but really building on uh, reporting techniques, styles, tools, ideas that boards and GMs have found to be useful. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a quick introduction to the overall project, um, what we're doing um, with it, and uh, a quick introduction to what we've been trying to create within the reports themselves, these sample reports. Um, as we go through, Clem is going to speak from his experience using this particular report today. Um, and I encourage uh, all of you attendees to write in questions um, and we will take questions both in written form, um, but also give you the opportunity to join the conversation with your questions as we go along. Um, so first let me say that uh, this uh, project, when we put it out to managers in particular, we said our, our hope is that we can help managers, you all create effective reports for your boards. and we, this idea of what makes an effective report um, has shifted over the years, and we're going to show some examples in this particular template today on uh, things that have turned out to be effective. A couple years ago, a group of managers uh, worked with Mark Goring um, to develop the first round of templates based on the C-Build um, policy suggestions and then used those, those managers began using some of the, the template reports and modified them and found new and better ways, some innovations uh, that made the reports even better. And so now we're revisiting that, that initial set, um, incorporating these newer ideas, things that have really been working for folks, and also incorporating uh, feedback we're getting from boards that are using this, this policy governance model and getting these kinds of limitations reports from their managers. And so uh, this is a project that really is the result of many people's uh, insights. Um, our job today, my job is to really just try to synthesize those. Um, I'm not going to lay any claim to being the smart person who figured out these innovations and insights. Um, and Clem will speak as a manager who's uh, using some of these tools and, and his experience. Um, so as I said, today, the first day, we're going to look at just one report, the financial conditions report, um, by the end of the project, uh, and there's a schedule of the project on our website. Um, we will have a set of template reports that managers can access and make use of uh, as much or as little as you care to in your own reporting to your board. So one of the things I try to do is, is uh, step back and just uh, articulate very quickly and clearly what it is we're trying to, what we're looking for within uh, monitoring reports. Uh, the, the whole reporting system rises out of our desire for accountability within our cooperatives, and the monitoring reports are the tool by which managers demonstrate accountability. Um, and so we want the reports to actually do that. Um, Second, though, we don't want this um, monitoring work, either the, the work that the managers are doing to create the reports uh, and the work that the boards do to, ride those, uh, to read those reports, to act on those reports. That shouldn't be an overly um, time-consuming, difficult part of either job, the board or the manager. Um, so we're trying to find tools and techniques and ideas that are very effective but also very efficient. Um, that, that work without a lot of extra time and effort. Um, we also want both the, the, on the reporting side and on the reading side, both from the perspective of the manager and the board, um, all the stuff, all the contents should be very clear, very straightforward, very easy to understand. 
um, we want we want as little obfuscation as possible uh, for the benefit of everybody involved, um, and so that the data is very obviously clearly connected to the definitions and interpretations. So with that in mind, that uh, that's what I am as I'm scanning the various reports that uh, some very kind uh, and diligent managers offered as examples of their work. I was looking for examples that fit these basic criteria, um, and uh, not surprisingly, found lots of great examples, and have tried to incorporate uh, what I felt like were the um, universally applicable ideas uh, for the template report. And I'll go through those in a minute. I just want to real quick show this uh, this uh, diagram, this graph, set of graphs. Um, this comes out of a, a, a survey that um, our CDS Consulting Co-op recently uh, did, asking our clients about um, what's working for them. And this, while this particular um, set of information, uh, the graph on the right, talks about communicating about ends, um, it shows a pretty remarkable relationship uh, between our our clients, our boards, our managers sense that the relationship between the board and manager is productive, and that one part of that is about the manager communicating ends progress. Now, again, this series of workshops is about the, the limitations reports. Last week, uh, Mark Goring, along with uh, Clem and other managers, talked about ends reports. But I just thought this would be a, a good visual reminder that um, how managers communicate to their boards is a big part of, is, is at least highly correlated with um, how boards and managers perceive the relationship. Uh, so with that in mind, what I want to do is I want to, um, uh, again, invite you to ask any questions that you might have um, as we go along. And um, ask Clem real quick, before I get into the details of this report, um, Maybe Clem, you could describe your uh, kind of your experience with this new template and how what what your reaction to it has been and your board's reaction, and just kind of set the stage for what we're about to look at here. So, so what happened? Yeah, to sure. You, Clem? Okay. Yeah. Um, can, is my voice okay? Can people hear? I, I, it sounds very good to me. Here. Okay, great. Um, the way the way that I look at this one, we I, I should back up by just saying that this was not the first. Um, the first template that we um, attempted to adopt. You know, we've been going through a process of over a year of going through our um, limitations uh, policies and you know reviewing them in the light of the uh, the template policies and seeing which parts you know trying to adopt the template if possible and seeing which parts from our old policies we should we should pull across or which parts of the template didn't work for us. So. Uh, the board has been uh, diligently w with me, diligently working on on this for a while, and a lot of the stuff uh, is kind of as obvious and makes a lot of sense. And and this one was a little bit different. And uh, I, I think I should just back up a little bit in time and just talk about, you know, where we're at as as a co-op. You know, we're in our eighth year in this since this major relocation project for us. And in the first couple of years, the the sales were so strong at the co-op. And the, the management was from a small co-op. It didn't have the skill set that we we got into financial jeopardy from, of all things, uh, sales that were too strong. So that too many people were hired. There wasn't. A, there was too much, you know, emphasis on the black hole of operations. Margins went haywire, and um, as as a result, um, financial information wasn't available. And when it was available, it wasn't good. And um, the board quickly adopted a policy of looking at. Um, at finance reports because the, the store was really in danger of going under um, in executive session. And that happened for um, several years that these B, we call them B4s, but the financial um, condition report was done in executive session through, you know, I've been general manager for four years now and in the first half year or so of, of when I got here, um, that's what happened. So the, f the first baby step was to pull it out of executive session. At that point in time, we were, you know, we were getting our act together. And then after that, the next step was um, reducing the frequency of it from monthly to quarterly and line it up with um, with inventories because a lot of it is, you know, the number one cost for all of our co-ops is cost of goods and 
it really doesn't make a lot of sense to report on those in non-inventory months, or right? it's not as useful information because it doesn't have, you know, doesn't have your stock figured in. So it's just purchases against um, against sales. So that went on for a while, and then so then we we went through our whole process of. Um, going through the limitations, and, and this one came up. It came up in time for um, us to do this. So um, what, the, what um, we suggested to the board is we do, we do both reports. We do uh, the old one and do it side by side with this new one so they could really see um, both of them together and then uh, contrast and what, what makes sense to them. You know, if, is there an increase in clarity? Is there an increase in understanding with having this new template? So that was kind of unusual for us to do that, but I think it really worked out well because a lot of them were, a lot of the managers, especially those that were maybe not as financially fluent as others, were, were able to, to really have, you know, um, both a visual and, you know, a, a visual way of looking at things. Is that so okay, Michael? Have, yeah, yeah, that's great. I want to just um, emphasize a couple things that I, I think you're describing in, in your and your board's experience here at Onion River is that this process, both the, the policies themselves and the style of reports and even the format of the monitoring from executive session to open session, that that has changed over the years based on both the needs of the board of the co-op and of the, depending on the makeup of the board itself. Um, so that's, I think that's something important for all of us to remember is that um, there's no particular assumption that there's uh, one one way to do this, that there's only one possible way. And, and when we present this template today, uh, there's, there's, no, um, there's nothing to say that uh, anyone believes this is the one and only right way to do it, but that this is something that, in this case, Onion River has come to find really works for them at the moment. Um, but your, you and your boards might find that some variation really makes more sense. So keep that in mind. We aren't trying to, to just present this as a all or nothing uh, perspective, but looking for how does this fit in with your on with with where you and your board are in your development right now. Um, I wonder if uh, real quick, Clem, if you could um, give a, a very just a few sentences about what happened when your board looked at when you used this template. So so at your last the last time you monitored this financial conditions policy, you presented this uh, similar at least to this template report and your board decided to, to use the template policy and, and to accept the kind of the formatting of the report. Um, and I wonder if you could just give us a, a very quick idea of what it is overall that you liked about the, the report from your perspective as a manager and what you think your board liked about it. Okay, uh, sure. Um, you know, for, for me, a, a lot of it was just uh, it was a real learning experience for me. You know, when I went into this, I said, okay, you know, I know what's going on with our finances here, and I, I just got to figure out um, how to just do another report, how to present the information in another way. But really something clicked with me here that I, th I think was important. I think the biggest aha moment was when um, I did this, I did this, the, uh, this report, and I presented it to um, Michael Healy to look at uh, as our board facilitator before I sent it out to the board. And Michael wrote back to me and says, you know, you're doing it the same way you did the other report. You're, you know, your data is covering the last three months. And he says, you're, you, know, the, you know, maybe we weren't clear on when we discussed this template report, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the board to focus on the big picture, not just immediacy. And so instead of looking back for as we do in most limitations policy over the, the short term, the three-month period, um, what we're trying to do is look back over a period of three years. And um, then I went back and again I looked at what the template graphs were. And they, although it, it, uh, it didn't, I didn't pick up on it right away, when I looked at that I said, oh yeah. And um, I reformatted, I redid it all over again, and I, instead of doing three months, we, we plotted all our, our data out over the course of three years for financial conditions. And um, I think the major thing is with this report is that it gets the board to focus uh, where they're supposed to be focusing on the big picture, on long-term trends of the co-op, on, uh, on the uh, health of the co-op over the long period of time, rather than just on the, you know, on the here and now. The here and now is there, but sometimes um, it has to be put in context. 
Actually, that's probably a good place to, to start pointing out some specific parts of this format here of this report, and then um, so our, our attendees can see what you're talking about, Clem. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, as we scroll through the whole report, I'm going to point out certain things that are showing as that I've highlighted uh, in this sample. Um, as we go through, if there's something you have a question about, uh, attendees, please, um, please write in your question. Um, and as we collect those, then we will um, have opportunities uh, throughout the workshop uh, at different times to uh, give you a chance to actually ask your question uh, live uh, with your actual voice. So please take advantage of that. We'd love to hear your question. Um, so real quick, uh, again, I just want to point out that the, um, this template report is based on the CBUILD template policy. Um, even if your board isn't using the template policy, um, this exact policy, I, I'm hoping that you will find some ingredients, some particular pieces of the report that you could start incorporating into your own reporting. Um, so it's not necessary that, as I said earlier, that it's all or nothing. Um, second, one of the insights that uh, some managers have found uh, very helpful is at the very um, top of the report, there's this, this section here that's kind of the introduction to the report. And uh, one of the things that uh, was very useful was this highlighted sentence, um, basically letting directors know right off the bat what they should expect in the report. Is this a report that's about all compliant issues, or is there something in particular that they should be aware of and pay close attention to? Um, and so a number of managers have started to insert statements like this one that you see here. And the third, or the second in this heading, um, the idea of having attachments, that rather than just hand directors a stack of financial statements and say, hey, here's, your, here's the financial report, this pile of papers, those papers are essentially seen as um, the, the data from which is drawn the data that's in this report. And so people can look at those attachments for verification of what's in the report. But in fact, they don't need those, all those financial statements to be able to actually monitor the operational financial conditions. Um, so that, those, that innovation there of saying we can put the key information based on the board's criteria in the report itself and that those other those financial statements really are the, the background material that the boards or directors can turn to for verification. Um, real quick, on this page, um, notice that there are, uh, throughout the report, you'll find both interpretations and operational definitions. And I'm not going to get into the details of, of the difference between those two, um, but Clem in particular, but many of the other directors who, uh, are, I'm sorry, other managers who participated in this project have started to really clarify in their reports to boards what their operational definitions are, where they really get focused on what they're doing for measurement. And so you can, you can see that throughout this report. And lastly, in this global section, one of the things that a number of managers have had trouble reporting on and, and monitoring um, is this idea of showing that actual expenditures uh, fit within the, the board's ends policies. And one of the innovations that some managers have found really works is to, rather than trying to list all the different expenditures and tie them to ends, just to remind the board that, in fact, if they are accepting the ends report, that's an indication that what the, what the club is spending money on is in support of the ends. Um, so there's a variety of ways that managers have found to say that, but to focus the board's attention back to the ends report rather than trying to do a laundry list here. Uh, so I'm going to real quick now scroll down to what Clem was pointing out that um, is very different in this format than what um, many managers have been doing up until this point. So, so two things, uh, several things here. One is um, in the interpretation, uh, the, the managers um, have been, not the managers, some managers have, have now found that they can state what the objective benchmark is that they're using. Why are they using this particular um, criteria to show, their, what, to show what, that what they're doing is reasonable? So you'll see in this report a couple different comparisons. Some managers compare to uh, the Cocoa Fist um, benchmarks, uh, if they're using that program there. Um, some might compare to 
Um, in this case, if, if we're talking about sales, um, there's some managers who are comparing their sales growth to inflation. Um, one of the managers who participated in, in sharing their reports, Tim Bartlett of, of uh, Lexington Market in Buffalo, um, actually compared very specifically to food inflation um, and showing that as long, basically saying that as long as our co-op is keeping pace with food inflation, then our sales are not are not declining, that we're, that we're keeping, keeping up with the rest of the economy, specifically around food. And so then the operational definition is a very specific, um, here's the measurement we're going to use. Um, what Clem was talking about in terms of showing uh, long-term information, what you see in a graph like this is a three-year uh, set of data. So if directors, rather than having directors focused on just what's going on in this immediate moment, they're also seeing what's happened historically. And for many directors, it's their opportunity. Um, whereas I think a lot of managers have this kind of picture in your minds all the time. You understand these trends. Um, directors often don't. They've come in somewhere along this cycle. Maybe even they were just elected. Um, but if you present this information in such clear graphical form, um, then they're saying, oh, look, there's actually a story here that our co-op has gone through some changes in the past uh, several years. And so like for this particular graph, you can imagine that uh, in the early part of the three-year span for this co-op, 80% um, sales growth probably was related to uh, an expansion project or something. Right? And so then, th then sales growth declined to be somewhat more reasonable. Um, and then the manager points out that um, we're only actually, compliance is based, as it says down here, on this very far data point here, but all the rest of the information is FYI. So throughout this report, you'll see several examples of uh, these graphs. Uh, just kind of remember the idea that uh, a, a picture is worth a thousand words, they say. Um, and we can use pictures to help our boards and our directors see a bigger picture. Um, now, Clem, as I go through these, I, I'm going to just kind of um, you know, slide down relatively quickly. But if you see something in particular that you thought was really interesting for you or for your board, please jump in and holler, OK? Yeah, I, I'd just like to say something about this first one, because this was a new one to ours. We didn't have anything about, um, about sales. It was mostly about you know, um, you know, ratios and financial conditions. And, uh, and this one here, I, I guess it, bo it bothered me a little bit to have this included, especially in light of you know the, the last what year and a half that we've all that we've been through you know nationally and seeing lots of co-ops around um, having you know not seeing sales growth at, at three percent. And I guess philosophically, I just had to wonder you know, you know about limitations. A lot of them were, were you know thou shalt not kind of things. You know staff treatment don't. Uh, don't have unequi inequitable treatment of staff and things that a manager has control over and you know really uh, you know like you shouldn't be doing do everything you, you know basically go for it do everything that you can but do not do these things and this the assumption being that you have control over the things that you do and you know what I brought up to the board and we adopted this we, we took out the term uh, shall be stagnant um, I, I guess just you know I'm not sure why other than I didn't like the language and it just really bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the, we left it in, and just with the, um, the, you know, the idea that you know this might not be on, in the manager's control, even though the co-op is doing the best that they can. There might be certain conditions that, you know, there will times when sales will will be uh, stagnant, and you know you have to report not being in compliance. But you know, it's a uh, it's one of those things. Yeah, that's good. Uh, a again, we're, as we present, uh, as our C-Build team presents these template policies, we developed them because we, we felt like they seemed to be the, the generally what club boards wanted to be focusing on, and we were trying to find ways to articulate that. But we aren't at all trying to say this, this, this should be the policy that your board chooses or that you should want to suggest as a manager. Totally up to you. One of the interesting things there at Onion River is after this conversation, the board president asked if I would um, present a little bit of education. The board wanted to learn a little bit more about why 
uh, our CBUILD team had this policy there, what we were, what we were thinking. And so the board is going to put that in their calendar of board education just to learn a little bit more about this. Um, so you can use these as, as learning opportunities, as educational events also. Um, so good. So we're going to um, keep on going here. The next one is about uh, net income. Uh, how, do we, how do we define what the board's expectation is about net income? And then how does a manager show reasonable accomplishment of that? I want to say here again, we're, we're just saying, just as an example, that you could use, say, the, the Cocoa Fist benchmark uh, for Jeopardy. Um, but some other managers, so, uh, some of the things that they're using, they're comparing their performance in terms of net income to other similar-sized co-ops or other co-ops in their region. Um, some, uh, there's a couple that are actually comparing to budget. Um, some managers have said, you know, if, if we're meeting budget, then that is adequate. Uh, so that's, again, up to you as a manager to decide what you believe is reasonable, and then for your board to decide whether they uh, agree or not, whether it's reasonable. So we aren't trying to say that you should choose this benchmark, just saying that choosing a benchmark that is objective, that is different than just the manager's personal opinion, but it's based on something outside of the, that personal opinion, um, can make it easier for boards to, to decide to agree that something is reasonable. So again, you see that the data here um, showing a long-term trend. Um, in fact, there's a couple managers that are even better at showing graphical data than I am who've, who show on the graph itself the benchmark line. And so even uh, more clearly visually showing the comparison between the benchmark and the actual performance. In this case, I just want to point out real quick, um, in this example, there is a out of compliance situation that this data point here uh, that we're actually reporting on um, is not above the benchmark. It's below the benchmark. And so in the report, the manager would present an explanation to the board. What's going on? Why is this the situation? And what's the plan? Again, that trying to help boards and managers understand that compliance isn't necessarily the critical component of these reports, but that the board would want to know that the manager is managing the situation, not that the world is always perfect, um, which kind of addresses your, your thought there, Clem, about sales. A number of managers who have sales limitations uh, have reported this past year or so to their boards, hey, you all, sales are declining, but there's a recession going on. And in fact, since boards know that, they aren't necessarily holding the manager, uh, holding the manager's feet to the fire about that, their understanding. Yeah. Um, and, you know, ab about that, you know, th I guess the reason I like um, the, you know, focus on um, net profit or the bottom line rather than on the sales line is because, well, it, it really, you know, it re my uh, mo moment was uh, Lindy Bannister said at one of our general managers meetings, she says, you know, in, in a, it was when we were all talking about the recession and the effects on the co-op, she said, I told everybody at the wedge that their jobs are safe, we're not going to let anybody go. And then she said, you know, we have an ability to, um, to you know, pull back uh, and control our cost. And it just like struck a, a, a re it, it really um, resonated with me that, and um, and I've been telling our staff all along, I don't care what our sales are because we were successful. You know, we're at almost 30 million this year. We were successful at 28. We're successful at 26, at 24. And, you know, we were able to be profitable. And so what, why couldn't we just, like, return to those levels and control our labor? And we, we do a good job with our margin. And so that's what I've been preaching. And it's been really resonating with people and really calming them down. So um, to be telling the board that, yeah, I'm going to be driving sales when I'm telling the staff a different message was, um, was just something that didn't sit really that well with me. Yeah, and it, I think that's such a great example of a manager having a conversation with the board about, well, here's, you know, here you all, I'm going to try to give you my perspective on this, still honoring that ultimately it's the board's decision, but I think what happened in your, your situation, Clem, is that you said to the board, look, here's how I'm seeing it, and just as you just did here, very clearly explaining why you think it would be an error to really focus on sales, and your board agreed, and they, they changed, they decided not to go with this, um, this template um, policy the way it was originally presented, um, in part because you helped them understand that s sales increases were not necessarily beneficial. Um, so, so again, with all these things, we're hoping that the reports actually help the boards and managers have the conversation that we need to be having together. 
Um, we're going to jump right down here to the, uh, the policy about liquidity. Um, again, you may or may not have this policy in, in your own, what your board has given to you as a manager. Um, here's one, though, that I thought was very interesting where um, a manager might say, well, there's this benchmark that I've been comparing to, like a Cocoa Fist benchmark. Um, but I also want to point out, the manager is saying, that we have a covenant in our loan that relates to this. And so I want to make sure that I'm meeting our loan covenant covenants. Um, so this is a place some managers have found. They, they put all these um, loan restrictions or loan covenants in one part of a report, um, maybe in this one, maybe in a, in a, a budgeting report or an asset protection report. I, I haven't quite seen if there's one place that makes total sense um, for everybody. But this idea that you could use loan covenants as your objective benchmark. Um, in this case, the manager saying uh, one of the benchmarks is actually more stringent than the other, and so I'm going to try to, uh, that my goal is to meet the more stringent one. And then again, showing the graphical data over several years, showing the picture and the trend, and um, again, with something like current ratio in particular, clearly something that is managed. And you can see how this changes over time for this co-op, how it's held steady and then is slowly increasing. And, and again, I'd like to jump in on this one um, on the current ratio. You know, if the co-op is showing like a current ratio of two to one, and then it's going down to 1.8, 1.6, 1.4, you know, a, a board member might be looking at that and saying, "Oh my gosh, we're uh, we're not the co-op's not doing a good job," or you know, it's it's nearing the financial jeopardy. Where um, in in reality. Um, for me, for my, my own opinion, is that the current ratio is more like a, a bell curve, where below this, let's say we're using the 1.25, below the 1.25 is bad, but there's a certain point where it's also bad if you have too much money on hand. You know, if you're sitting on like a 3 to 1 current ratio, I don't think it's smart for the co-op because you should be using that money. It just shouldn't be sitting in, you know, an account to pay current bills. And there's no, there's no subtlety in this one. It's, but um, I, I guess you just have to you just can't, for, I, and so for me as a manager, I'm, I'm trying to figure out in advising the board um, how far to go with something like that because most of the people on our board anyway are not that financially um, fluent, and so yeah. you just don't want them to misunderstand something that you might be actually doing a good thing by bringing it down to a lower level rather than be doing a bad thing as long Absolutely. as it's above. Yeah. I, again, I think this that's a Great example. Thanks, Clem, for pointing out that it's, I, I don't think that it's possible to do all of that, what Clem is describing, within policy or monitoring reports, that some of that really is about education, and it really is about the conversation. And so within the policies, we're, our CBUILD team is really trying to get boards to understand these limitations as really that. They're just sort of what would really be unacceptable, what would be bad for your co-op if it went in a certain direction and make that limitation. Some boards do make a policy about a range for current ratio. They, they understand what Clint was just describing. Um, what we've said in general, we feel like this works for most boards. Um, but I think you would need to do just what you were doing, Clem, just as to say to a board, hey, you all, here's the report, here's how I'm showing compliance, but I also want to do a bit of education here. I want to make sure you all understand that I'm managing this in a particular way, for example, because I don't think it's good for us just to be sitting on cash and not using it. Um, so I think the ongoing education is always going to be a part of this reporting. So the reporting is really just, here's the data, here's the benchmarks, um, but outside, if there's no other uh, education going on, um, people could still interpret data in a million different ways. So I think board training or um, you know, the, that voice of the manager saying, well, I just want to make sure I understand what I'm showing you here and why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Very, very important. So I've, I've been, again, trying to see how do we do this, this, this policy governance model um, that is all about specific, uh, you know, using data and using policies and limitations, but doing it in a way that basically works for people and doesn't try to try to pile all eventualities into, into this particular part of the model. Um, and right now, I'm feeling like this is a pretty good balance. Um, but again, there's, there's a number of ways to, to use this model that works for managers and boards. So don't get stuck thinking that you've got to do it only this way. 
Um, and then here's our last graph of this particular report. Um, it's about uh, solvency or debt to equity. Uh, and again, here's a picture where clearly anyone coming into this uh, at this very moment, a board member who's just elected, could still see that something has happened here over the past three years. There's been a big change. Um, and that change probably relates to something else going on, maybe an expansion project or something. Uh, so the, the picture tells the story again. So those are the, the four parts of the policy where graphical data is very useful, um, very uh, telling, helps managers see a bigger picture. Some of the other parts of the policy, um, we uh, find that what managers are doing is using um, like what you see here, a table. So this one is about incurring debt um, and the manager's ability or inability to incur debt. It has the authority to incur debt. And managers are using um, tables to take information that might be in a balance sheet, for example, and pull it out and highlight it essentially here for directors so they can see this is the um, key information that otherwise might be buried somewhere on a balance sheet. Here I've pulled it out for you, showing you what's important about it, and uh, using that also as the clear, reasonable data about my, meaning my, the GMs following the board's limitations. So you'll see a couple examples of that throughout this report of, of incorporating, taking information out of those attachments, the balance sheet or the income expense statement or so forth, and placing it very concisely in the report. Um, here again, the, the manager is referring to the balance sheet, um, pointing, point, basically pay, pointing a finger at a particular part of the balance sheet so that the, man, the directors can see there is, that is the evidence. That's, that's where things like real estate would show up. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, here is a good innovation. Um, the uh, one about tax payments being uh, filed on time or correctly. Um, some managers were finding they were trying to pull together um, statements from the government or receipts, or it got to be really cumbersome. And uh, some some folks found that it was actually easier just to tell the board, look. If we haven't gotten a notice from the government that we're overdue or inaccurately filed, then we're good. And that's something that is verifiable if, if the board felt the need to do some direct inspection. Um, but it's a very simple way to remind the board, hey, I'm following your policy here. Uh, so we're just skipping right on down. Here again, this one, um, there's a, a, a laundry list in the, in the sense that the manager has created of uh, when the board is talking about payment of contracts, payroll, loans, and other obligations, the manager uh, in, in this case has really outlined what that means to her or him, and then giving the data uh, to show compliance or not compliance. Um, and uh, again, a table um, so that boards can see something over a period of time. In this case, there's one particular commitment uh, a financial obligation, and the manager is showing how that has changed over time. Uh, so, so a board member could see that long-term picture uh, here. You could also do something like this graphically, um, but here's a table. Um, anything you notice, Clint, that you want to point out? Some of these things are now are kind of straightforward, I think. But yeah, yeah, no, these are these are just kind of. You were going into the thou shalt not kind of things here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, using restricted funds. This is one that um, my experience has been that a number of boards and managers are unclear on this concept of restricted funds. Um, and again, from the CBUILD consultant team perspective, we've been trying to help boards understand what it means, but also helping managers understand um, that it's not restrictions really are meaning someone else outside of the, the manager um, has placed a restriction. So if the manager says, well, I'm going to you know, just start keeping a savings account, that doesn't necessarily make it a restricted fund. It's restricted uh, in this interpretation if the board or some outside authority has restricted it. And, and that interpretation then really simplifies the reporting for managers. And so then you'll see that um, a manager can give a real clear statement of, 
is there a fund that's been restricted? Who restricted it? Why, did, why is it restricted? Um, and can I show data, which what you see here in this table is the data about a particular fund um, and how much money is in it. Again, data that's taken from a balance sheet and put here for, for ease, for clarity. Um, so that's, that was a really neat innovation or an insight that some managers had. Uh, and just lastly, uh, the one I wanted to point out, and again, if you all are thinking about who are sitting in and listening, if you have questions, I know some of this is pretty straightforward, but if you have questions, this is going to be your chance because in a few minutes we're going to call it a day. Um, the last thing I want to mention is this idea of attachments um, that, uh, in this case, the, the manager saying, you know, our, our data is the, for showing that we're following accounting principles, uh, is a statement from the auditor. Um, and so the attachment that proves the auditor said it's okay um, is that, that letter that came with the audit itself. Um, if you're doing this as a quarterly report, you probably aren't going to attach that letter every single quarter, but you might do it once each year and then remind the board of that. Uh, so again, a nice use of attachments, a nice use of objective information that boards can see that's not just a manager's opinion but comes from somewhere else, and then the data is easily accessible and easily verifiable. Um, so that takes us through this first uh, financial conditions monitoring report. Um, there's other parts of it that we didn't necessarily go over in detail. Um, I just want to highlight a few things as we went through. I encourage you all who are listening in and others who will come to look at this later to kind of look through the details and see which ones actually apply to your needs at your board. Um, so I just want to check one moment if, if there are any questions that anyone has. Um, and as folks are thinking about whether they want to write in a question, um, is there, uh, is there anyone who, um, or Clint, is there anything you wanted to say in particular while we're thinking about um, questions? Uh, just uh, on the uh, restricted funds there, you know, I was, I had a misconception that, you know, that we had a, that anything we would need for our loan payments was a restricted fund, but that really was covered by the current ratio, or, or if you're using a loan covenant instead of, uh, uh, you know, at to set your your current ratio, and so we we turns out we didn't have any restricted funds, and I was just jumping through hoops trying to figure out what they were. Um, yeah. So I don't know how common they are out there. Uh, so I, I would probably, you know, if you're a, a manager and you're wondering what the heck they are, you you, you might want to find out from your auditor if if indeed that you have anything that that meets those requirements. Yeah, that's a good that's a good advice because I think you are not alone with many managers trying to think. Oh my gosh, what are the restricted funds? And um, and I've seen a number of managers kind of create restrictions just so they could report on a restricted fund, but it wasn't an actual restriction. Um, Joel, I want to just check. I, I see that there's been some written questions coming in, um, and I will respond to the ones that I see written. But are there any that um, you have the ability to put someone online who might want to ask the question aloud? Um, sure. Well, we have a couple questions. I can. Uh, Miles Gachita from Peoples in Portland, Oregon, has a question. I'm going to uh, unmute you, Miles, and go ahead and ask your question on the air. Great. Are you there, Miles? Am I here? Hey. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Go ahead. Um, so, so Miles, you want to you want to um, ask your question aloud so everyone can hear it. Yeah, it was just um, is just simply stating that Cocoa Fist or NCJ has this benchmark. Is that enough to say that's our that's our measurement? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great question. So would would that benchmark coming from say NCJ or Cocoa Fist mm -hmm. be considered reasonable uh, as a, as an interpretation? Um, and what I have found is that I've yet to find a board who has not accepted that as a reasonable interpretation. And essentially, it's. Um, it, I believe. Uh, again, I guess you could ask all these different directors why, but it it really seems that because the manager has gone to an outside authority, somebody who does seem to represent the larger co-op world, and that that larger body, say the NCGA, has said this is what what we believe is a, a, a benchmark. Then, when the manager reports that back to the board, boards are saying, "Great, we're glad you've got." Um, a reliable resource the, uh, to to define a benchmark. Uh, 
um, the, the ultimate answer to your question, I think, would come from your board. Um, would they accept it as reasonable? Um, but like I say, my, my experience has been so far, um, no board that I've worked with has not accepted that. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. All right, great. Anything you want to add to that, Clem? Um, no, no, I think that, that works. I, I, before, we, uh, before we adopted the template policy, I remember we had a, a brand new director who, who read our old policy and said, well, you know, how do I know that, you know, this is, we, we had some pieces in based upon our loan covenants, but she was saying, how do I know this is right? How do I know that you're just not making any of this stuff up? And she was saying it in a very friendly way, but she just said, you know, what's the verification that, um, that these things that you're reporting on are, are really true? Um, she, she says, I just want to know in case people ask me. And I think that you have to look at this report as a sort of piece that's part of giving them the balance sheet, the income statement. Uh, also, you know, it, it should be um, it, it should be consistent with the annual audit that was done. You know, that there shouldn't be any surprises, anything different than the auditors. If you're, you know, your auditors should be reporting to the board annually on what happened. So, uh, as sort of the whole piece of cloth, this shouldn't be any any surprise. And I, th I think that the uh, third party objectives are, are are really important in that. And as long as you have one that's credible, it could be loan covenants, it could be you know Cocoa Fist, it could be uh, any number of, of sources that work for you. Yeah, great. Uh, we do have two other questions queued up. I'm going to ask John Kidney's question uh, for him, but he's asking for more clarity from either of you uh, about the difference between uh, an interpretation and an operational definition. Nice. That's a great question. Um, and it, it's one that um, I think it took a while for many of us using this this model to, to really understand. So the operational definition is really the place where the manager is telling the board, this is the measurement, this, this is the thing that I'm going to be measuring, and it's this benchmark that I'm aiming for, and that's how you will know whether I'm in compliance or not. And the interpretation is really then, why do I believe that measurement is the right one? Why do I believe it's reasonable? Why do, what's my rationale for using that measurement? So it's kind of a two-step process, and you can come at it from either way, um, I found anyway. Um, and maybe, Clint, you could in a second describe if there's some where you start with the definition or some you start with the interpretation. But essentially think of it as two pieces. The interpretation is the rationale, why choose that particular definition. And the definition is really a very specific letting the board know this is the data point you all should be looking at or that I'm going to show you, and this is how you will know whether I'm in compliance or not. And that definition r arises out of the interpretation. And so then the data itself is actually kind of, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's like, oh, no big deal. We all got all the basic information already, and the data is actually just that, just a piece of data now that, that is, we should be able to look at it and immediately know whether it's showing compliance or not compliance. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I probably would just rephrase it slightly differently. You know, uh, I, I would always start out with the interpretation. Like, and I'll give you a specific example. Our end policy says, you know, our co-op will have a will be part of a thriving and healthy community. And my interpretation for that would be at least one of them, for one part of it would be, you know, um, childhood hunger in our community is an unacceptable condition. Uh, as part of being a thriving and healthy community, and but that's there's nothing to that. It's it's fuzzy. It's like it feels good, but the operational definition then will have specific tangibles to it, measurements. So what what would the co-op do that would you know lead it towards being more observable, more measurable in terms of of like say getting rid of childhood hunger in your community? And you might say, you know, food stamp um, will be increased at our co-op. There'll be more. Um, However, the, however many money, uh, the things that you want to do, or the co-op will be giving more to the local food shelves, you know, 5% more each year or more than your budgeted sales growth, and you could have those things in there that are that there's very specific pieces that are, um, that are that fit under the uh, interpretation. So uh, I, it was, that was another light bulb that went off for me because I was trying to do them both together for a long time, and it, I was just getting myself all mixed up. So separate out the interpretation and then have the operational definitions having the measurements. Yeah, good. It's, it's a great question, John, and there's a certain um, art to figuring out how to do that well, and 
what you're hearing from Clem is you know, a manager who's really gone through this several cycles and tried to really clarify for his own self uh, and for his board why are we using the measurements we're using. And, and so it's not something that Clem, the first time he reported on any of these policies that he had all figured out. So you know, he's done this several times over and getting more clear each time on what are the measurements, where do they come from, how will I show the board that I'm either in compliance or moving toward compliance, whatever that might mean. Um, there's more information about uh, interpretations and operational definitions out there. And uh, I encourage you, John, if you have more questions about that, um, to check with uh, your CBUILD consultants if you're working with somebody. Um, if you don't find anything, uh, feel free to give me a holler, and I can point you in the direction of a couple different resources. Um, but I think your fellow, your fellow uh, managers can really help you on that one, too. Any other questions, Joel, that have been coming in? We do. We have one other question from Lori Burge, also in, from Peoples Who Co-op in Portland, Oregon. And uh, her question I'm going to ask for her. Uh, basically, some members of, uh, of our board keep wanting the management to interpret that we have restricted funds because they don't understand the outside nature of this policy. Uh, could you give some examples of how to explain that well to the board? Um, yeah, this is, this is a great question that would uh, lend itself toward a uh, maybe a, a session of financial education uh, you know, for the board to, for them to incorporate this into their ongoing uh, study work. Um, if you wanted a, a very quick um, response, uh, I think what I mentioned earlier is really the key is that um, it's restricted if somebody other than the manager has restricted it. That's what it means. And so um, if the board wants to restrict a fund, it can do so through policy. If a bank, a loan, a lender wants to restrict a fund, and that is frequently true where lenders will tell a co-op, hey, all right, we're going to lend you all this money, and one of the things you have to do is maintain a cash reserve of a certain amount. That then becomes that cash reserve becomes a restricted fund because the lender will say, and you can't spend any of that fund unless we give you permission. And so it's an outside authority. It's, some, it's something that, um, again, that, that it's a restriction that's placed on the manager by someone other than the manager. And I think that's really the critical piece of this. And it's one that I think has confused a number of boards and managers. And that's why I really like the way it was defined in this report. I think that might be just including that language or something like it, Lori, in the report to your board might be very helpful. Um, it's just to remind them that restrictions you know, if I decide for myself that I'm not going to do something, that's not really a restriction. That's just, just me talking to myself. Um, a restriction is where someone with authority over me has limited my choices. Um, and again, I think the way that we found some managers respond to that in this, in this report was, was very articulate. So hopefully that helps. Um, and again, if, if you want more clarity, I encourage you to talk with your CBUILD consultant or one of your fellow managers who's been working on these. So I think that's the, uh, that's the last of our, our uh, sent in questions. Is that true, Joel? That is true. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Hey, I, uh, I, I so appreciate um, that uh, folks have uh, called in or um, sat in on this conversation. Um, it, we're going to do it again next week on a couple more policies. Take a look at our schedule online. Um, as always, you can access this information. Uh, after the fact, but it's great to have you here live. Um, I want to again thank you, Clem, for being here. Your insights are incredibly valuable um, for both my learning as a consultant for boards, but also for the folks here today and for your own board. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Clem, before we call it a day? No, that, uh, just thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for everybody uh, tuning in. Yeah. Um, so. We're going to call that the, the end. This policy um, report will be posted on our CBUILD uh, library. Please check it out and use as much of it as you find useful. Um, so thank you. And Joel, if you would do us the uh, good graces of closing out the broadcast, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>